Tonight, multiple CBC News investigations into big Canadian companies and what they're costing Canadians. Undercover the big banks, employees say they're under pressure to push products to make money. I felt like I had to mislead customers. Marketplace asks, why is this still happening? We're hoping to speak to you about a story we're doing about sales pressure within the bank. More pharmacists are calling out Shoppers Drug Mart after its president told us they weren't under pressure to hit targets. I was very angry because this is not the truth. And premier after premier take on the prime minister and his carbon tax. I do not understand for the life of me what the federal government is, is thinking. That's an easy thing for short-term thinker politicians to say, oh, we'll get rid of the price. Hike or no hike, at issue on who pays the political price. From CBC News, this is The National with Ian Hennemanse. We have several exclusive investigations for you tonight, starting with the big banks. Customers are still being pressured to buy products they don't need years after CBC News first exposed the practice. Employees at Canada's five largest banks reveal they're being pushed to upsell to make more money, and financial advisors are giving guidance that's not just wrong, experts say it's against the law. Marketplace caught all of it on hidden camera. Erica Johnson first broke this story nearly a decade ago, and she's leading our investigation tonight. We're going undercover into Canada's big five banks. I'm just here to make a deposit, actually. Testing what happens when we approach the teller wicket. We have a credit card limit increase for $8,000. Oh, cool. okay. You're qualified to get a pre-approved uh, personal loan. Still able to get a credit card with us. Current and former bank employees tell us the pressure to meet sales targets can be overwhelming, even lead to bad financial advice, says this BMO employee who recently quit. Someone else is reading his words to protect his identity. He still works in finance. I felt like I had to mislead customers in getting products that they didn't need. Lines of credit, credit cards, good for the bank, potentially bad for you. You might not realize how much this is a dangerous thing to have. Um, it, can, it can add up really fast. This TD employee resorted to secretly recording coaching sessions with her managers. Someone else is reading one manager's words, heard pushing this employee to upsell customers. You think of them a lot, so that's why you don't want to put force on them it kind of backfires for you in meeting your goal. TD says that conduct is completely unacceptable and not in line with the bank's policies. Back on hidden camera, we also visit financial advisors of the big five, ask about the fees we pay on mutual funds. Several advisors incorrectly say the fees are only charged on the profit, not the whole investment, like this BMO advisor. They take it out of your returns. The Bank Act spells out employees can't take advantage of customers. So this bank critic's take on our hidden camera test? They're not only getting bad advice, they're getting illegal advice. The Canadian Bankers Association says our findings do not represent the experience millions of Canadians have every day. We requested an interview with the Federal Finance Minister, Christia Freeland. She declined and when we caught up with her at an event, we're hoping to speak to you about a story we're doing about sales pressure within the banks. So, Erica, nothing from the minister who oversees the banking regulator. Well, Ian, her office later did send a statement saying the government has zero tolerance for banks offering misleading and inappropriate financial information and that the government has added consumer protections to the Bank Act. Now, those protections were in place when we did our investigation. And as we mentioned, you investigated the, the high-pressure sales environment seven years ago. I did, and at the time, thousands of current and former bank employees reached out. So it would appear that little has changed. Eric Johnson in Toronto tonight. Thank you. And you can watch the Marketplace season finale Friday at 8 p.m., 8.30 in Newfoundland on CBC Television and CBC Gem. There's a new twist in another investigation tonight. More pharmacists are speaking out about Shoppers Drug Mart. Last month, the company's president denied there are targets for provincially funded medication reviews. But as Angelina King shows us, pharmacists say that's not true and they can prove it. Current and former Shoppers Drug Mart pharmacy owners are speaking out. Their issue? 
this comment. Um, so we don't have targets or um, or any other kind of element like that. The president of the company firmly denying accusations of targets for billable medication reviews just last month. But more than a dozen current and former shoppers pharmacists have told us a very different story. It was really disturbing to us as associate owners to hear that. CBC News isn't identifying the pharmacists because they fear reprisal for speaking out. We aren't using their real voices either. I was very angry because this is not the truth. He knows full well that they're in place. But they all have the same thing to say. Shoppers' leadership does pressure them to meet targets and not just for medication reviews. We have brought this up many times starting last year that there shouldn't be any targets or quotas when it comes to professional services. Most professional services like medication reviews and prescribing for minor ailments are billed to the provincial government. Internal documents from across the country obtained by CBC News show weekly and yearly plans for how much money pharmacies are expected to bring in from professional services and pressure from higher ups to hit those numbers. Like this January email from a district manager stating, I am writing to express my deep disappointment in our team's performance during the first week of 2024. Despite clear plans and expectations, it is evident that we fell significantly short of our targets. I expect each team member to reflect on the reasons for this deviation from our plans and be prepared for immediate improvement. CBC News requested another interview with the president of Shoppers. We were told he was unavailable and the company stands by his previous remarks. It also said it's reinforcing mandatory training on the appropriate use of pharmacy metrics and how to communicate with pharmacy owners and their teams, and that its role is to help owners by working with them on a yearly plan to deliver professional services. But current and former owners say while they support providing these services, they have zero say in that yearly plan. It is totally unethical to have targets. Angelina, the people you spoke to shared a lot of information, including some billing numbers. What can you share with us? Well, there's one in particular I want to mention in Ontario. That's the province with the most shoppers locations. So in a single week last month in Ontario, the company billed more than $1.8 million in professional services. Most of that was for medication reviews. Now, something important I want to note, shoppers doesn't answer to a regulatory body the way pharmacists do. And so a few former owners say this puts current employees in a bit of a tricky situation because if they do crumble to that corporate pressure and then engage in some questions questionable behavior to hit targets, it's their licenses on the line. Angelina King in Toronto. Thanks. The federal government confirms it quietly ordered a national security review of TikTok last September. Ottawa says it can't comment on the case, but the revelation comes after the U.S. House of Representatives overwhelmingly passed a bill yesterday that would ban TikTok in that country unless the Chinese company that owns the app sells it. CBC News is tracking the number of measles cases across the country. They're rising, and so is concern. So far this year, there have been 29 confirmed cases. That's already more than double the total for all of last year. The infections are spread out over four provinces. The majority of those cases, 19, are in Quebec. Lauren Pelly starts tonight in Montreal, where health officials are trying to control the spread. A cluster of measles cases in Montreal has officials on high alert, now at 14 infections. We've seen that the uh, level of coverage of, of vaccination is, is not enough for us. Quebec launched vaccination clinics at multiple hospitals this week. Provincial officials estimate thousands of kids could be at risk since some schools have dangerously low immunization rates. In Montreal, there are some schools that are very low, under 50, under 40, and even some uh, uh, under 30. So those are places that are really yes, at risk to have a, a, a big outbreaks of measles. More cases are popping up in Ontario as well. An adult in the province's cottage country got infected from an unknown source, while a child in Hamilton fell ill following a trip overseas. When there are outbreaks, obviously it makes it that more uh, critical for people to be uh, staying on top of the vaccinations, particularly childhood vaccinations. 
In 2017, close to 9 in 10 Canadian kids had both doses of the measles vaccine by their seventh birthday. But by 2021, that dropped to roughly 8 in 10 kids. A small change with big impacts. Absolutely. We are headed towards major outbreaks. This physician says unvaccinated children could bear the brunt. That child is at very high risk for being hospitalized, being very sick, possibly even dying. Over 100 cases. So just how big can outbreaks get? These figures show the... This epidemiologist shared her team's new modelling exclusively with CBC News. Once you get down to 60% coverage, that's here with the 0.6, you see a much larger outbreak that um, can potentially be in hundreds of cases. In larger communities, low vaccination rates could mean thousands of infections. If you end up with sustained transmission, Canada could even lose its elimination status for measles, which it's had since 1998. So, Lauren, modeling is a mathematical prediction, far from a certainty, but how likely are these scenarios? Well, we had several experts review these projections, and they agreed that big outbreaks are very possible in Canada for a few reasons. One being that there are these pockets of low vaccination rates in certain communities, and there are already massive outbreaks happening globally. We're talking nearly 60,000 cases over the last year across Europe. And of course, many Canadians will be traveling to those hotspots this month for March break. So I hope some of them are bringing back a nasty souvenir. Ian? Lauren Kelly in Toronto. Non-essential staff have now been evacuated from the Canadian Embassy in Haiti. The humanitarian and security uh, catastrophe that's going on in Haiti right now uh, is extraordinarily challenging. The country is in the grips of gang violence. Global Affairs Canada says most embassy staff have been relocated to neighboring Dominican Republic, while a skeleton staff, including the ambassador, will remain. This comes just days after the U.S. and U.N. drew down their embassy staff amid the chaos. Next, we want to take you inside Gaza's only functioning maternity hospital, where medication and supplies are scarce. And at least one doctor tells us she's horrified by what she sees. Chris Brown now with the stories of pregnant women, new mothers, and their babies trapped in a war zone. After years of trying for a baby, Ala Jabbar is eight months pregnant with her first child. Displaced and trying to survive in a camp in Rafa, she spoke to a videographer working for CBC News. My baby's weight is low because there's no fresh or healthy food, she said. I have low blood pressure from malnutrition that causes me to faint. The UN says on average there is only one toilet for 340 people in camps throughout the Gaza Strip and expectant mothers aren't drinking water to minimize the need to visit them. The doctor said, I'm dehydrated, Ala told us. I've caught infections and bacteria from the state of the toilets. When the time comes to give birth, she can only hope it will be less excruciating than it was for Nurman Abu Saif. The 37-year-old gave birth in November by C-section, but anesthetic was in short supply. I only had half of the regular amount of anesthesia, she said. She was discharged after less than a day because the hospital needed the bed for someone else, forcing her to return to a dirty, crowded shelter. In a recent report, UNICEF said the babies of 5,500 Palestinian women who will give birth in March are at risk of dying due to a lack of access to pre- and postnatal care, and in part because the anxiety of trying to survive in a war zone is leading to premature births. <laughs> Dr. Hina Chima is an American obstetrician who's volunteering in Rafa's only functioning maternity hospital. And what she's seen has horrified her. There are only five labor beds, and they're delivering between 70 to 100 patients every single day. I've been seeing so much more stillbirth and everybody, all the OB staff here, is talking about how much that rate has increased. Supplies for newborns are scarce and expensive, especially diapers. So at this workshop that used to make wedding dresses, seamstresses sew together leftover cotton wool and nylon to produce passable substitutes. It's a small bit of resiliency, but Gaza's infants and mothers will need far more if they're to have a fighting chance. Chris Brown, CBC News, London.
The father of a teenager who killed four students at a Michigan high school in 2021 has been found guilty of involuntary manslaughter. A jury convicted James Crumbly for failing to prevent his son from carrying out the killings. Crumbly had bought his son the gun used in the shooting. James Crumbly's wife was convicted of the same charges last month. After 15 years of accusations, convictions and appeals, a former Quebec judge has pleaded guilty to manslaughter in the death of his wife. But as Alison Northcott shows us, while his legal journey finally appears to be over, there's still no agreement on what really happened. Jacques Delisle marked the end of his long legal saga by pleading guilty to manslaughter in the death of his wife, Nicole Rainville. There is not this cloud over, over him anymore. That's certainly a relief. It's been 15 years since Rainville, partially paralyzed from a stroke, died from a gunshot wound to the head. Delisle has always maintained her death was a suicide, but he was convicted of first-degree murder in 2012 and sentenced to life in prison. He appealed and lost. How did you? Delisle later told the Fifth Estate and Radio Canada that he gave his wife the loaded gun she used to kill herself, but that he didn't murder her. There are innocent persons in prisons. You have one in front of you. The federal justice minister ordered a new trial in 2021, citing a likely miscarriage of justice. After nearly nine years in prison, Delisle was released. In this latest court appearance, the Crown and defence didn't agree on what happened that day, but did agree on a guilty plea to the lesser charge and a sentence, time served plus a day. The charge that I thought was more appropriate was um, assisting suicide. But it was not accepted. Prosecutors say they still believe the original murder conviction is closer to the truth, but say the case has gone on long enough. He's been almost nine years in prison, 88 years old. Uh, we do not believe that we will have been able to stand trial. I've always thought it unfortunate this case was ever prosecuted in the first place. Lawyer James Lockyer took on Delisle's case after he lost his appeals. Whilst today has an unsatisfactory tinge to it, uh, it's nevertheless uh, uh, a day that enables Mr. Delisle to, and, and his family uh, to get back to normalcy. Delisle's one-day sentence lasted only a few hours. By the end of the afternoon, he was free. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Immigration consultants offering jobs in Canada are being accused of scamming customers. They're making money in a multitude of different ways, one of which is selling people a false promise. 30 grand lost and claims of abuse. The fifth estate investigation into a PEI operation. Next. Plus, understanding unexplained itches. It's on my sides, it's on the back, now it's on my thighs. How scientists are scratching the surface on a potential solution. And a moment of sportsmanship for a lifetime of memories. I told him he shouldn't do it, but well, he didn't listen to me, so <laughs> I'm here. We're back in two. SpaceX is celebrating the most successful launch yet of its massive Starship spacecraft designed to one day carry humans to the moon and beyond. And passing supersonic, so we're now moving faster than the speed of sound. The cameras on board captured its ascent and journey halfway around the world, over 200 kilometers up at more than 25,000 kilometers an hour. I need a moment to pick my jaw up from the floor because these views are just Stunning. About an hour later came its fiery descent back to Earth. Oh man, we can see the heating on those flaps as we're starting to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. SpaceX confirmed the craft did not survive re-entry, but it says it completed a number of key goals. Two previous Starship launches ended in disaster when the rockets exploded shortly after takeoff. Now to a new Fifth Estate investigation into an operation on Prince Edward Island accused of defrauding vulnerable foreign workers and even the Canadian government. And as Stephen D'Souza shows us, some of it was caught on camera. 
Okay, hi. Hi. How are you? Yeah. Yeah. Using his cell phone, Yan Lu secretly recorded meetings with immigration consultants that he says offered him a Canadian work permit for more than $30,000. For a job on Prince Edward Island and the promise of permanent residency, both, he says, turned out to be fake. Uh, I felt like I might have been scammed, but I didn't want to believe that because they promised me a real job. Wu first came to Canada from China legally to help his autistic daughter go to school. Now he's one of dozens of workers who filed abuse claims against this orchard on PEI. In 2014, Canadian nectar products started with big names, like former Deputy Prime Minister Sheila Copps backing it. Within two years, Copps and some of the founders were gone. Then problems began. In 2022, Canadian Nectar was raided by the Canada Border Services Agency, accused of being part of a network of companies applying for permits for jobs that didn't exist, with one company allegedly charging illegal fees for work permits. They're making money in a multitude of different ways, one of which is selling people a false promise of, of what this country is. They're scamming people. The Fifth Estate found the federal government gave 31 workers connected to Canadian Nectar permission to leave the farm after they filed claims of abuse. The whole experience was like a nightmare for me. Canadian Nectar did not respond to requests for comment. I was furious again, yes, at the employer, of course, but more at the government that is allowing this type of systemic issues to, to happen. But even after all those complaints, the companies have not been fined or been barred outright from the foreign worker program. Employment Canada would not comment, citing privacy, while the CBSA would not confirm if it's still investigating. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, Toronto. Watch the entire Fifth Estate investigation Friday at 9 p.m., 9.30 in Newfoundland. On CBC TV and CBC Gem, you can also stream it on YouTube after 1 p.m. Eastern. Scientists are narrowing in on the potential cause of an irritating condition. These bacteria are the ones driving the itch. The work being done to block your brain from reacting. Plus, Ad Issue digs deeper into the controversy over Canada's carbon tax. There needs to be a pause on, on this tax. Analyzing the Prime Minister's response as premiers unite against him. And that's an easy thing for short-term thinker politicians to say, oh, we'll get rid of the price. The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. There's fresh fallout tonight to the royal photo fail. One of the world's biggest news agencies, AFP, now says Kensington Palace is no longer a trusted source. Earlier this week, the photo of the Princess of Wales and her children made headlines around the world when it was discovered it had been altered. The princess later apologized, but not before several news organizations pulled the picture. Researchers say they're a step closer to solving a mystery. What is it exactly that causes us to feel itchy? Tashana Reed now with the new science that could lead to some relief. We all know the feeling, scratching that itch. But for some, it can be unbearable. This is the collection I've got here. For months now, James Tressler has been dealing with a chronic itch. It's on my sides, it's on the back, now it's on my thighs, then it's on my uh, calves. Despite blood tests, multiple doctor's visits, different creams, it's unclear what is triggering it. I don't have any dry skin, I don't have any rash marks, there's no redness, my skin looks perfectly healthy. The mystery of what causes that itchy feeling is one that researchers are working to understand. These bacteria are the ones driving the itch. At Harvard Medical School, some new clues. We were wondering, could certain microbes, when there are too many of them on the skin, actually trigger itch? The answer, yes. Researchers found a common bacteria can invade the skin, releasing an enzyme that activates nerves and sends a signal to the brain to scratch. It shows you that itching is, you know, triggered by the bacteria can be pretty damaging. That finding is prompting more research including how to potentially block that reaction. I will see patients scratching their skin to the point they're bleeding in my office. 
One of the most common culprits of itch is eczema. 20% of children and 10% of adults experience the skin condition. But itching can also be a sign of serious problems like liver or kidney disease. And the impact of itch goes far beyond the physical. Things like depression and anxiety have also been linked to um, poorly controlled itching. 26th of January. As for Trussler, he's trying new medication, but he's still itchy. It may be helping, maybe. And if it is, that's great. Maybe it's just wishful thinking. He hopes that with more research, more solutions are on the way for people like him. Tashana Reed, CBC News, Strathroy, Ontario. Now it's time to break down the week in politics. At issue this week, provincial pushback to the carbon tax. Seven premiers from different political perspectives are all coming together to say that there needs to be a pause on, on this tax. We want a cleaner environment, but we think there's ways to do it without taxing our ways into uh, making the cost of living uh, unbearable. The Prime Minister is doubling down on a hike next month. And that's an easy thing for short-term politicians short-term thinker politicians to say, oh, we'll get rid of the price. So what's to be made of the pushback from the premiers and might the tax increase be delayed? Rosemary is away this week, but Chantal Hebert, Andrew Coyne and Althea Raj are here to break it all down this week. And Chantal, let me start with you. Uh, and, and what do you make of the prime minister's response to the premiers? Uh, that those who believe that uh, the tax hike is going to be frozen or that the, the Prime Minister will back off on this between now and April 1st, should uh, look at, at uh, that video and understand that what he did to himself and his government was to close the door uh, on backing off from raising the carbon tax on April 1st. I think part of uh, the argument that uh, Justin Trudeau put forward was for the larger audience. But he, he might also have been speaking to some members of his own caucus who probably would feel more comfortable with a freeze on the tax. And so, Chantel, do you think uh, it, it clearly is closing the door, no room for any kind of change here? I heard, um, my colleagues may differ, but I, I heard the, the sound of the door being locked on the notion of, of, of backing off on this. Remember, the prime minister said last fall that they were, would be, there would be no more carve-outs on the carbon tax. Uh, and he has to keep in the back of his mind that um, his environment minister might not be up for uh, sticking around for another uh, retreat. And Andrew, what's your analysis of, of where we're at right now? I, I think the phrase that Chantel may be going for is throwing your cap over the wall, so you have to go get it. You know, you, you, you commit yourself in a way that uh, makes it more or less impossible to back down. He's trying to turn this into a virtue. I think he was even quoting or paraphrasing Margaret Thatcher, you know, you turn if you want to. Uh, it, that would be a more compelling take. I mean, I agree he cannot back down now, but he's not, not likely to reap the benefits as much as he might of taking this firm and principled stand if he hadn't already backed down uh, on the Atlantic heating oil thing. And, and similarly, he was trying to sort of score points against Pierre Polyev, saying that the Conservatives, because they don't want to use the carbon tax, are going to use the heavy hand of government, regulations, subsidies, the same old picking winners, failed approach, et cetera. That would be a much more compelling story if the Liberals themselves were also not doing that. They're only using the carbon tax for a third of their uh, planned and projected emissions reductions. So he's trying to make the best of a bad situation. Uh, much of it is of his own doing. Uh, but I certainly agree that at this point, for them to cave at this point uh, would, would just absolutely crater whatever remaining credibility they had. And Althea, if indeed the government goes ahead with this tax increase, what's the potential cost for them? Well, I'm sure we're going to get a bunch of emails uh, saying it's not a tax, <laughs> it's a price because you get the money back. Um, I, I see it like Chantal does and Andrew. Um, I always get a little nervous when um, government people don't want to actually sign their name on the emails or the messages you get back saying, we're obviously not doing this. But uh, I do think publicly he did close the door this week. I think more than that, though, he views carbon pricing as part of his legacy, and he does not want to jeopardize it. He already suffered immensely in the fall when he 
uh, amended the rules on home heating oil uh, to please his Atlantic caucus. And we all know the revolt that happened um, across the land on that issue, a revolt that continues to happen with Saskatchewan's decision, uh, and the consequences of which are still unknown, frankly, from the federal government. So uh, I agree that the prime minister is not going to do this. I also think that if he did do this, uh, the environment minister would walk. Um, I also think it would make it really hard to continue. And so that would be the end of it. And it would it would be the like the death blow to all progressives. Like that is the one thing perhaps that they have uniting them to, at the polls next time. Uh, without this, you know, what is the prime minister's legacy? Andrew, when it comes to climate have, change, yeah. Andrew, we have seven premiers here. And uh, as Daniel Smith said, of, of different political persuasions. Um, and, and is there anything among those seven premiers? Is there anything that any one of them said that might give the liberals a little room to move even a little bit and say, OK, we're, we're going to try to to compromise based on what this person has said? I don't think so. I think that the reason you have such unanimity is because the liberals are at 24 or 25 percent in the polls. So it's a free kick. Uh, why would you not, if you were a, a premier who does not actually have responsibility for this file, but can just kind of mouth off, essentially cost-free, uh, why would you not pose as the great defender of the common person, even though you're conveniently ignoring that the common person gets a rebate that exceeds the amount of the carbon tax? So it's pretty cynical politics, it seems to me. And again, would, would be, there'd be no benefit to the Liberals uh, at this point to be, to be paying them any heat. No, uh, and there's a lot of... Um of inflation uh, in, in what some of the premiers are saying. The clip you put there, making the cost of living un unbearable. Seriously, getting a refund? There are two provinces, two premiers missing in action on this, uh, BC and Quebec, because the federal carbon pricing doesn't apply there. But that also means that Quebecers and British Columbians who, are, who have carbon pricing and who do pay for it are not getting a refund from the federal government you would think they would be the first to say our lives are unbearably expensive. That's really not happening. And to say premiers of all of many persuasions, let's be serious. It's six conservatives and one liberal. Fair enough. Um, Althea, I'm not clear on this, and, and I wonder if you are. The carbon tax rebate, the idea of, of you know, lots of families presumably getting money back, um, does that resonate, do you think, with, with voters? Well, I think the government acknowledged by changing the name of the rebate that they had done a terrible job of communicating it. The other problem is they kind of tied their own hands when they decided when they came in government in 2015 that they were going to do less partisan advertising. In fact, they were spending less on government advertising that's, you know, not red and white <laughs> um, or even, you know, any, any other color. Uh, you're starting to see a bit of an increase. I've noticed watching regular television that there are more government ads, but they could spend more money reminding Canadians that this isn't a tax, that eight out of 10 Canadians get more money back than they put in. Um, and they decided early not to do that. The environment minister um, has argued publicly and privately that he thinks that more efforts should be made, and clearly that has persuaded some to rename the rebate. I don't know, frankly. I think they've, less, they've lost the comms war. Like, I don't know that they're going to be able to convince people in the 12 months that are left that really this is a, a grand strategy that makes people better off uh, in the end. Uh, I think Mr. Polyev has been very successful in prosecuting that case. Let's be and clear, so, though. It's a yeah. good thing, and it's the right thing, that government should not be spending taxpayer dollars on essentially partisan messaging. Yeah. So it, letting people know that there's a rebate available, fine, but uh, pushing out the thing that, that, to, to, to sort of correct uh, their, their problems, you know, communicating for their own partisan interests uh, um, uh, is not something anybody should be encouraging. Yeah, I don't but, but disagree Andrew, with Andrew on that. But if you compare it to, like, the economic action plan ads, for example, that we saw during the Harper era, you know, th there is no such similar messaging coming from the Liberals. No. But, Andrew, I'm wondering, I guess, how would you assess the way the Liberals have communicated all of this if, if you know sounds like you're saying they shouldn't spend lots of money on ads but should they have done a better job to try oh, yeah. to make people better understand what this is about governments have an enormous ability to get what they call earned media to, to to set the news agenda to get their message out they don't have to actually spend a lot of money usually we talk about 
what a, what a disadvantage the opposition is at because they can't control the agenda the way the government can. So, yes, I, I, don't th I don't think anybody would say they've managed the communications on this terribly well. Going right back to square one, they, they got too clever by half with this, made it too complicated, tried to make the provinces uh, you know, wear it, it rather than having it as a, as a fully federal initiative. The, the whole thing has been way too clever and too cautious, and ultimately they're paying the price for that, I think. But they also, uh, they also let their guard down in the sense that they believed that they'd won that battle. Uh, they mm -hmm. fought two elections on it. Yes. Uh, some of the same premiers lined up behind Andrew Scheer, remember, the picture of the resistance, and still the liberals won. In the last election, the conservatives, under Aaron O'Toole, campaigned on a platform that included carbon pricing. Yeah. And then the federal government won against the provinces in the Supreme Court. So uh, what changed all that is not so much Pierre Poilievre, although he took advantage of it, it's the affordability yeah. crisis uh, and the notion that you can use anything that can be called a tax. And except for liberals uh, in government, everyone calls it a carbon tax. That is, right. that is how it is seen. Even Andrew Let's... Fury in Newfoundland and Labrador, a liberal. We'll end the conversation uh, there, but uh, at issue next, the company that charged millions for the Arrive Can app grilled by MPs. Why did you lie to this committee? It was not a lie. I was just unaware. I hadn't checked all of my outlook. We'll break down the testimony so far and what, if anything, we've learned. That's next. At issue, just how much did taxpayers end up paying one company for the Arrive Can app? MPs and committee fired their questions at the founders of GC Strategies. Do you think you can really justify to them uh, that you, uh, who was recruiting other people to do IT work, uh, were billing at $2,600 an hour? I can't comment on what my hourly wage is. I can just comment on the fact that we've had 55 contracts prior to these ones at CBSA where the government's seen value in everything we do. So how damaging has this testimony been for the government? And has it answered any of the key questions about ArriveCan? Chantal, Andrew, Althea are back. And Andrew, let me begin with you. Did you learn anything? Did we learn anything from the testimony? Uh, as little as the, uh, the two uh, co-partners in this venture would like to let us. I mean, there, there was uh, epic uh, memory failures. And, uh, and uh, I, I, I don't know about you know, key elements of their own business. Uh, so they weren't uh, ideal witnesses, shall we say, in their own cause. But I think what we are learning slowly is uh, Arrive Cane is only one part of a much larger, I think, problem in contracting, government contracting and government procurement. Uh, you know, Arrive Can had, I should say, GC Strategies, the company that was uh, on the grilling session in the last couple of days, uh, had many more contracts than just Arrive Can, and there's many other businesses doing the same kind of routine of, of contracting out to subcontractors uh, than just GC strategies. Mm -hmm. uh, and it seems to be fairly endemic, and there may be reasons to do with the structure of procurement that makes it profitable for companies to come in and be the middlemen on this. It may be that, there's, we've put, that the government's put too many obstacles in the ways of just directly contracting with the, the smaller contractors. So I think if we keep pulling on this string, and I hope these parliamentary committees will, uh, I think we're going to find there's a much larger problem than just ArriveCAN, as shocking as the details in ArriveCAN are. Althea, watching the sound bites from that committee, uh, lots to, I think a lot of people were frustrated by what they heard. Uh, you would have seen a lot more of what the testimony was. What was your sense of, of what you learned? It's mind boggling, actually. Today's testimony <laughs> completely floored me. I think Comedy I laughed routine. out loud. Yeah, at least four or five times. Like the, the things that were coming out of his mouth. Um, I agree with Andrew, and we've talked about how government procurement is uh, broken and how it's very onerous uh, to bid on government contracts, and I think that's why the rules were basically there to be exploited, and many companies like GC Strategies uh, found a way to do so. But there are other things that are emerging now, like whether or not they were actually following uh, what their contract said in terms of like protecting people's privacy and safeguarding documents at the level that they committed to doing. Um, I, I mean, I think if anybody at home was sitting on the couch and watching this, your takeaway would be like, wow, 
you can run a company without like any knowledge of anything, not understanding your fiduciary duty, um, and make millions of dollars. Like you don't have to be in quite intelligent to make millions of dollars. Other, the other thing I would take away is these guests, these witnesses, mm -hmm. are clearly misleading parliamentarians. Um, and it will be up to parliamentarians to, and you started to see that a little bit today, uh, to fight back and to insist on answers. And everybody, I think the public, is better served when MPs do recognize that they have a lot of power and they should exercise it. And this is, a, a, you know, this is beyond partisanship. There are like real how government works issues here that I think all MPs can unite behind. Chantel, do you think we're being well served by what's happening in this committee, or is it just political posturing? Oh no, I I, I think uh, parliamentarians have a role to play in that. I I'm not sure that they have the final role. There are many other players, possibly more neutral, but certainly the exercise in the parliamentary committee has its usefulness, but I mean, the liberals get to wear this because they're the government and they've been the government over the time of the pandemic, which probably opened the door to even more sloppiness and abuse. But at the end of the day, what's troubling about this is that this is going to be a problem. Whoever in government is going to have to try to find a way to fix it. It, it is a government functioning issue. And while it is mind-boggling, some of the stuff you hear, I'm not sure that we should be that surprised considering that this is the same government uh, apparatus that finds it hard to deliver passports, for instance, uh, or to fulfill some of its most basic duties. So, um, yes, uh, the pandemic probably exacerbated uh, the situation, but bottom line, there seems to be a, a, a systemic problem within the civil service. And Andrew, what about a political bottom line? Do you think uh, this will have political consequences, the, what comes out of this hearing? Well, I hope it, I hope, I don't necessarily expect, but I hope it will have political consequences in terms of becoming an election issue. Uh, now, the cheap thing is just to say, this was on the Liberals' watch, let's make them wear it, and you know, any opposition politician would, would be hard-pressed not to fall into that temptation. But the larger question is, how do we fix this? How do we make sure we don't get future Iraqans? Because I, as I say, I think if we keep pulling on the string, we're going to find a lot more uh, than just a Rive can. And certainly, if you look at, for example, the state of military procurement, where routinely contracts are let out for, you know, let's take the case of the shipbuilding contract for $26 billion and come in at $84 billion. That dwarfs uh, anything to do with the Rive can and suggests, again, that there are systemic problems here. When I think it's two officials in the Auditor General's office uh, are dismissed for cause because they were running businesses on the side, uh, it suggests that the, 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 either the state of the rules or the state of the following of the rules in the public sector uh, is, is, is endemic, as I say. Althea, 30 seconds, last word to you on this. Or the awareness of the rules. I do think, and it's, this is not a very sexy topic, and I do think government, like the political government, can set the tone down the line, but there seems to be, and we have seen this for years now, a very big problem with the public service itself. Like, it doesn't seem to be able to deliver on the things that it should be delivering without involving the political leadership um, and whoever forms the next government will have some real look like this is a huge mess at all levels across the bureaucracy that needs fixing and it's not a sexy topic to talk about um, but it's a really important one and Chantal's right I mean how can you not get passports on time how do we still have phoenix issues mm -hmm. it's unbelievable unbelievable it is a real privilege to have a front row seat to this panel thank you very much up next, an athlete gives up his spot at the Arctic Winter Games so his friend can compete. This is the heart and soul of the Arctic Winter Games. The surprise winning streak came next in our moment. This is Gallagher de Bramo, a Yukon biathlete who's just won multiple silver medals at the Arctic Winter Games after he almost didn't qualify. That was until his friend Chase O'Brien gave up his spot so DeBramo could compete. That true act of friendship that led to a successful showing is our moment. He's killing it on the course. We're competing in biathlon at the Arctic Winter Games. It's a combined discipline, a combination of racing on skis or snowshoes with target shooting boats in between. I think I got second. It's all right. It's 
pretty good. That's Gallagher being Gallagher. He's he's really good. He's doing what he's supposed to be doing and analyzing his his competition. I mean, to sum up the story, we nominated a team, and one of our team members, Chase, declined his position in favor of uh, letting one of his teammates go. From what he says, you know, he didn't want his buddy to miss out on the chance. I was happy to be able to go to Arctics, but I also felt bad because I didn't want to take a spot. I told him he shouldn't do it, but well, he didn't listen to me, so <laughs> I'm here. I was very happy and like grateful. I, I believe he's won silver in every competition that he's competed in at this event. This is the heart and soul of the Arctic Winter Games. It's not a, a cutthroat first, second, third. It, it's building community, building sport, building young people. And this is just uh, another perfect example of, of how this all plays out, I think. It is a fascinating example of that balance of wanting to compete. He got all those silvers, but at the same time, that kind of collegial feeling among athletes. And hey, a shout out to Gilmore Junio. Remember that name, the speed skater in Sochi, the Canadian who gave up his spot for a teammate to compete. Thank you for being with us. You can watch anytime, anywhere on the free CBC News app and subscribe to the Nationals YouTube channel. I'm Ian Hanneman Singh in Vancouver. See you tomorrow night.